There's been a significant amount of work on the, the relationship between hunger and unrest conflict riots. But here's the question that we as a, as a community of global actors must ask. Yes, we need the food, but should the Russian government benefit from the purchase of that food? Hello and welcome to G Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer. And today, Russia's war in Ukraine, already having a rippling impact around the world, supply chains disrupted, energy prices skyrocketing, and most alarming, the number of people facing acute hunger, especially in parts of Africa and the Middle East, is rising precipitously. We're gonna talk about what happens when two nations that produce a third of the world's wheat, Russia and Ukraine, go to war. My guest today, Erthren Cousin, former director of the UN Food Program and CEO of Food Systems for the Future. And then these days, everything is political, even borscht. Onions and carrots are most important. But first, at anti-war rallies from London to Toronto to Istanbul, sunflowers have become a powerful symbol of solidarity for everyone standing with Ukraine happens to be Ukraine's national flower and one of its biggest products. Ukraine produces more than half of all sunflower oil exports globally. That oil is used to make all kinds of things, including some of your favorite snack foods like chips and cookies. The shortage caused by the war is already driving up prices for all those packaged goods, but also for all the other cooking oils that are being used as an alternative. Now take a look the flag of Ukraine, the blue, represents the skies and mountains, got plenty of that, rising above the yellow fields of wheat. Ukraine is a global breadbasket and combined with Russia, produces 30% of all wheat exports, 35% of the world's barley. The timing of this war, just as spring begins, means that Ukraine's planting and harvesting seasons are disrupted. Sanctions against Russia are restricting shipping, transport, and trade, further limiting global food supplies. Most at risk, of course, lower income countries that depend on those grain imports, especially in the Middle East and Northern Africa. Egypt, for example, currently gets 80% of its wheat imports from Ukraine and Russia. Further sanctions against both Russia and Belarus have impacted the market for fertilizers that are needed to grow those crops. Combined, those nations export 40% of all the world's potash. It's a key nutrient used in farming. And all this comes as the world was already experiencing record high food prices brought on by the supply issues during the pandemic and the growing impact of climate change. The United Nations Food Program estimates that as many as 47 million additional people could be pushed into acute hunger globally because of the war in Ukraine and the disruption to food systems that it's caused. That program's former executive director, Erthren Cousin, is one of the world's top experts on food insecurity. Here's our conversation. Ambassador Erthren Cousin, welcome to G-Zero World. Well, thank you for this opportunity to talk about this very important subject. Now, you have said that this is now a perfect storm in terms of global food insecurity. Why don't we open up with you just explaining a little bit of what you mean by that? We're seeing that now with the both wheat and corn prices um, doubling and uh, and continuing to escalate. Uh, we also the another indicator was high fuel prices. I need not tell your audience about the challenges of the of high fuel prices, and and everyone who's going to the pump recognizes how high our fuel prices are now. But that has a direct impact on the cost of food because of transport costs and the when there is an escalation in fuel. We are now seeing as fuel prices increase, increase um, and increases in the production of biofuels. Um, and finally, the fertilizer challenge. The fertilizer challenge began um, even before the start of this year, where the International Fertilizer Association was suggesting that there would approximately a 30 percent 
reduction in the amount of fertilizer that was available to, in sub-Saharan Africa in, in, in particular. And that 30% could and, and result in affecting the, the uh, of course, it does have result in affecting the yields and could uh, affect the access to food for about 100 million people. All of those factors came online even before the Russian invasion into Ukraine. And so with all of those factors online and the Russian invasion, that's the perfect storm. We know that approximately 30% of all the global wheat that is produced is, is produced in Russia and Ukraine combined. Uh, we know that over 75% of the essential oils, particularly sunflower oil, sunflower oil yeah. is produced uh, in those countries. And the, many would argue that that loss in production and distribution uh, and transport of those of those commodities should only affect or would only affect those who import directly from from Ukraine and Russia. But in reality, yes, it does affect those countries. But because of less availability on the market of stocks, it re affects the entire global community because it raises the prices. Yeah, those countries we're talking mostly Eastern Europe, North Africa. Africa, direct imports from Russia and Ukraine of largest scale. But these are global markets. These so, I mean, the prices markets. are going up. Prices are going up for everyone. If supply chains are a problem, it's a problem for everyone. Exactly. And that is exactly what we're witnessing. And the the, the challenge is that um, agriculture is, is, is a seasonal business. And so we are seeing this with um, the spring wheat. And now we know that the Ukrainians are not in the field planting. Uh, for, and so we have the challenge of summer and winter wheats now. Uh, and so that means that we're not talking about a short term problem here. This is a lo much longer term of uh, potential food challenge. I know prices went up on food and on energy around the world, in part because of supply chain challenges with pandemic and suddenly demand just explodes and you don't have ships in place. There's massive fiscal stimulus. But what, what was behind the sudden uh, lack of availability in fertilizers? Well, the component parts of fertilizer also include gas. All of those component parts uh, and the availability of those component parts affected the production and it resulted in higher costs as well as less availability of, of fertilizer. Now I want to turn to Russia, largest grain producer in the world. So much of the conversation in the United States is we got to cut off their oil. We got to cut off their gas. We got to cut off their coal. We can't give them that money. I don't see anybody saying we got to cut off their food because we need their food. I don't mean the Americans, but poor people all over the world who are relying on food production. What do you do when the country that's engaged in the war crimes is also absolutely essential to the supply chain for the poor people's food on the planet? Well, indeed, the F Food and Agriculture Organization, the director general, has asked for an exemption for Russian commodities from the sanction. With that exact uh, thought process in mind, that they have such a significant uh, effect on the availability of food for hungry people around the world, that that should be recognized by the global community, and we should allow those commodities into the global food chain. But here's the question that we as a, as a community of global actors must ask. Yes, we need the food, but should the, should the Russian government benefit from the purchase of that food? And how would you how would you stop that since they're the ones that are responsible for allowing or not allowing the export? That's the challenge. That's the challenge. It's that the, the true conundrum of should I allow the most vulnerable, particularly because that's who's affected with uh, with high food prices. Should I allow them to go hungry? because I don't want to financially benefit the, the Russian government. And those that's the question that leaders of the Security Council must make 
in 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 making that final determination about the access to Russian food. Because here's the reality: if if the if if the if the Security Council says no, the non-aligned countries who support you need to ensure the, the, the continuance of a global order that, that, uh, that prohibits this type of behavior, you can't ask for their support for a political issue when their people are starving. And you certainly can't do it when the Europeans are much wealthier and they're actually paying the Russians to get their energy. That is the, as they say, the elephant in the room. How do you say that it's okay for to exempt the the gas for Europe, but not the food for the global South? Whether we're talking about the pandemic uh, or whether we're talking about climate change, and now we're talking about food, these global crises, and we kind of know who's taking it on the chin. It's the poorest countries in the world and countries that through 50 years of globalization had hoped that they were going to be doing better over time now feels like it's crisis after crisis after crisis. How, how is the United States, how are the wealthy countries going to maintain any level of trust and alignment with these poorer developing countries through the kind of crisis that we are talking about right now? Well, that's a really thorny but vitally important question. The the reality of it is the, the the countries in the global south are watching the decisions that are made to allow Russia to continue to sell oil and gas into Europe so that their prices uh, don't go up and that they have access to the gas that they need. While at the same time, we are suggesting that they sacrifice uh, their access to food when the when we do not allow for an exemption from the sanctions for Russia to sell food to those countries when their people cannot afford the higher price food. And many of these countries are, are continuing to reel financially from the investments that they made in supporting their people during COVID. So their debt levels are quite high. Their finances are quite low. And now they cannot subsidize and support the cost of food. You know, last year, I guess there were 9 million people that we lost on this planet because of hunger, because of starvation. When you look at what we are facing, this perfect storm over the next one, two years. Do you have any assessment of what that number might look like? Well, we saw the increases, as, as you've just mentioned, in the number of those who lost lives. And we've seen the increases in to, to some 275 million who are acutely hungry now as a result of the COVID epidemic. And that number increased by 100 million people between 20, 2000 and 2021. This crisis, if, if nothing is done, we could witness between 100 uh, to be between 200 and 300 million additional acutely hungry people. And, and that's not unusual. The number did get up to the number of food insecure increased to a billion in with the 2008 food crisis. And so those are not numbers taken from the air. They are numbers that reflect the, the populations that are what we call hot spots, potentially affected, uh, the number of people who are in the category of vulnerable, and the, the, their, their lack of access to food would then total that number that I've just that I've just articulated. Now, um, when I think about massive food stress in the world today, I think about Afghanistan, I think about Yemen, uh, I think about Bangladesh. Um, I'm wondering what what you would add to that list, places we might not think about as much that are, are potentially uh, going to slip hard over the next year or two. Yeah, well, I I'd start with those places like the ones that you've just you've you've just listed, Afghanistan, et cetera, but also uh, Somalia, Yemen, Northeast Nigeria, um, 
Ethiopia, places where we see very high numbers of acutely hungry today because we know that those con- those populations are directly dependent upon the World Food Program's ability to access enough food to provide for the assistance that they need in order to meet their food assistance requirements because they're in conflict. I would also include countries uh, like Haiti, uh, Burkina Faso, Mali, um, Bangladesh, and we can go through a long list, Guatemala, places where you have populations that wa- are, are vulnerable because the, 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 the incomes are so limited and you don't have governments with the capacity to subsidize higher priced foods. Earthman Cousin, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me. As you've just heard, food security is at risk partly because of the war in Ukraine. But food is also part of the conflict. That's right, there's a battle over borscht. And G-Zero's Alex Clement is just the man for the story. This is a bowl of soup. Borscht, to be precise. And this is the war in Ukraine. What could these two things possibly have to do with each other? Well, more than you'd think. Earlier this month, Russian Foreign Ministry spokesperson Maria Zakharova had this to say about why Russia is so angry at Ukraine. This isn't the first time that relations between Russia and Ukraine have soured over soup. In recent years, Moscow has angered Ukrainians with tweets claiming that borscht is a Russian dish. So what's the beef over borscht? Well, various versions of the beetroot-based soup have been eaten for centuries, all across Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. But most historians agree it was first made in what is today Ukraine, and Ukrainians want credit for that. The globally renowned Ukrainian chef Yevgen Klopotenko has led an effort to get UNESCO to recognize borscht as a uniquely Ukrainian dish. He says it's about more than just what's on the menu. The borscht is a part of our history, a part of our identification. And if they will take our food, they will take half of us. And then they will take half of our language, and then they will take our religion, and they they can take our lives. And there is no more such nation as Ukraine. But borscht isn't just high politics. It's also home cooking. It's very important, this color, you see? Sofia and Mikhail Turovsky moved to New York from Ukraine in the 1970s. They recently had me over to their Brooklyn apartment for some homemade borscht, the Ukrainian way. My mother was saying, on any dish, you have to have a little bit um, magic. When I asked the couple about what borscht means to them, Mikhail the artist had a very different answer from his wife, Sofia, the retired engineer. Uh, just tasty food. For me, it's a philosophy. <laughs> philosophy of life. <laughs> Borsh is the uh, greatest ingredient of life. But there was no disagreement about where Borsh is really from. Russians picked up it from Ukrainians, I think. But it's absolutely Ukrainian food, yeah. Still, when I tried to draw them out on some kind of deeper, mystical, culinary connection to their homeland, Sophia shot me down. When you uh, make borscht, is it like a way of connecting with Ukraine? (laughs) I don't think so. (laughs) I don't think so. It's food, you know. For her, it's about something more personal. I always think about my mom when I cook because uh, all my life I was a working woman and cooking wasn't a pa- uh, <laughs> big part of my life. Yeah, I, st- I learned it from my mom and since my mom passed away, each time I do something, I think about her. Meanwhile, 
5,000 miles away, Ukrainians continue to fight for their sovereignty, for their culture, and of course, for their borscht. For G Zero World, I'm Alex Clement. That's our show this week. Come back next week. And if you like what you see, or you're concerned about food shortages, and you want to start stocking up your root cellar, or maybe you don't have a root cellar, you want to start planning for putting a root cellar together, you know who you want to go to. That's us. Why don't you subscribe to our most excellent newsletter? It's called Signal.